Why do you think that Oregon, who is typically liberal, is now moving towards the right? My opponent's policies, my opponent's records, and frankly, her approach to our state leadership in our state has led Oregon down the wrong track. Measure 110 in your plan for Oregon's future that you recently released. Yeah, Oregonians a few years back had a ballot measure in front of them that focused on the need to have support for people that were facing addiction, recovery services. And so they passed the ballot measure. What the measure actually did was legalize hard drugs like fentanyl, heroin, meth. Hello, WJ Live. This is Olivia Brown, your host, and I have Randy DeSoto, who is our senior staff writer for the Western Journal. And then later, we will have a very special guest, a gubernatorial candidate, coming on to talk about her race. So last night was primary elections for several states. The one that has had the biggest controversy and the most news is in Wyoming, where Liz Cheney lost in a landslide. Yeah, it was uh, it was fun. I have to say, <laughs> it was fun to watch the uh, results last night. In the sense that you know the polling going in showed that um, Hageman had Harriet Hageman had about a thirty point lead, and she exceeded that, which is kind of unusual. Uh, yeah. Well, depending, sometimes Republicans are underpolled, but uh, that's true. But Let's, yeah, to see that, what, 37 points is where it's ended up, somewhere right around there. That's amazing. Let's show this uh, poll right here. We can see that Harriet Hagman won 66.3% of the vote, leaving Liz Cheney at just 28.9. So essentially 29% of the vote. That is sad. That is pathetic to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I... You know, I, I saw, you know, of course, the, the media, the mainstream media was trying to prep the ground, you might say. Yes. Where they were saying, yeah, it looks like she's in a tough race. <laughs> so yeah. That was an understatement. Tight race. <laughs> yeah, it's not tight races when it's 66 to 29. <laughs> and that, you know, she even then, even as they got closer to election day, they're saying she's probably going to lose, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like, no, she's going to lose. And and then I saw a tweet saying something to the effect of, from one of the major news outlets saying that this will set her up though for a potential Republican presidential run. I was like, to me, I was <laughs> like, if you lose this badly for your own state as an incumbent, then how are you going to win a presidential? That that's that's just how I feel about it. This really shows how the Trump effect played because Harriet Hegman was endorsed by President Trump and Liz Cheney was famously known for in voting to impeach President Trump after January 6th and has been a very big critic of President Trump. There's been a lot of back and forth between them, you know, that Trump loves to call her a rhino, which is Republican in name only. So she was one of the people that voted to impeach. Let's show this right here. This shows these are all the different people that voted to impeach and how their races have been reflected. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You had four go down and defeat by my count and then four retire. And of course, my two favorite of those were, you know, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, who are on the mm -hmm. January 6th committee, who the Republicans, of course, were not able to appoint anyone to that committee um, that they wanted to. You just had two never Trumpers on there. Yeah. So Kinzinger, I think, saw the writing on the wall. He's he's a relative young man. He If he wanted, mm -hmm. and I think he kind of enjoys being a congressman, but uh, he was not going to win, you know, a re-election there in Illinois. I saw the only two that have come out through this thing were a representative from California and one from Washington mm -hmm. State. And yeah. then another from Washington State uh, did go down to defeat to yeah. the former Special Forces veteran up there. But Kent. California and Washington are already pretty typically liberal. So the Republicans probably are more moderate. And exactly. Yeah. That could lead to that as well. No, I think that's what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it has been really weird also that Liz Cheney compared herself to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, that was the weirdest thing in her defeat speech last night, that, that this is what she had to say about it.
The great and original champion of our party, Abraham Lincoln, was defeated in elections for the Senate and the House before he won the most important election of all. Lincoln ultimately prevailed, he saved our union, and he defined our obligation as Americans for all of history. Speaking at Gettysburg of the great task remaining before us, Lincoln said that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. As we meet here tonight, that remains our greatest and most important task. Most of world history is a story of violent conflict, of servitude and suffering. Most so, wow, that to me, I was like, how egotistical can you be to compare yourself to the president that freed slaves? Well, it's not even historically accurate when you get down to it. You've got, you know, Lincoln, true, he lost in two Senate races, lost in mm -hmm. the sense that, you know, it wasn't until the 19, early 1900s that they changed the Senate voting. Like before yeah. it used to be done in the state legislature. Oh, interesting. So, so he lost in the Illinois state legislature twice when he ran for Senate. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a loss. It wasn't really an election per se in the sense that we think of it. And then when he ran in the House, he did lose once. He tried to run and he did not win a primary election in the House. And then he won in 1846. But he pledged, because of the dynamics in Illinois at that time, to only serve, you know, one one term in which he did so he left in 1848 so it wasn't like liz cheney's situation here mm -hmm. she he didn't run and lose he he just didn't run again in 1848 so even those comparisons yeah. are it's very inaccurate. skewed how inaccurate. she <laughs> decided to put it it shows also how she is so egotistical that she thinks now that she could run for president this is what she just had to say recently about her potential run now the former president said last night, you're now headed to political oblivion. You said this fight is just beginning. You've even uh, launched a political organization already. So let's just be straight about it. Are you considering running for president yourself? Well, what I'm going to do, Savannah, is spend the next several months uh, completing my work in Congress, obviously completing my work representing the people of Wyoming. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of work left to do on the January 6th committee. Uh, and also, though, uh, I'm going to be making sure that people all around this country understand the stakes of what we're facing, understand the extent to which uh, we've now got uh, one major political party, my party, uh, which has really become uh, a cult of personality. And we've got to get this party back to a place where we're embracing the values and the principles on which it was founded. Uh, and, and talking about, you know, fundamental uh, issues of civics, fundamental issues of what does it mean to be a constitutional republic. But Congresswoman, you didn't answer me yes or no. Takes yeah, to I know keep that Donald you... Trump. I will be doing whatever it takes to keep Donald Trump out of the Oval Office. Well, I know you didn't say yes or no, and that's fine if you're thinking about it. But are you thinking about it? Are you... Again, how are you going to win it in an entire state election, entire country election if you can't even win in your own state so yeah you're a republican or yeah republican incumbent in wyoming you know which is a very republican state and you don't pull 30 percent of the vote and and so what does that translate to the rest of the country i my speculation is she'd be lucky to pull five percent in most any state you know in other words there is a le never trump trump block of voters yes there, among the republicans here in arizona and in other yeah. states uh so they're out there but I I suspect they're probably about five percent. So I even if say for some reason Trump didn't run in in twenty four, mm -hmm. you got DeSantis, you've got you know Cruz, yeah. you've got you know so many other people who have much higher name recognition. Nikki Haley, you know, yes, Nikki Haley's a little more in the Cheney mm -hmm. way of things. She's more towards the center center centerish. But she's more well liked than Liz Cheney is. Yeah, by by far, and you know. Nikki Haley had some tough things to say about Trump right after uh, the she January 6th well. stuff, but she's kind of moderated and let it go, whereas Liz Cheney just can't seem to let it go. No, she can't. But it is interesting that she was an incumbent. So this shows that the Trump effect went over the incumbents, 
incumbency effect, which if people don't know about this, it's a phenomenon that basically says if you are an incumbent, if you are currently in that seat, you are more likely to win. And it's something that we've seen play out over and over again throughout history. This shows the Trump effect goes over the incumbency effect. And this is what President Trump had to say about Harriet Hagman and Liz Cheney losing so incredibly badly. He was able to go to Trump Social, which is basically his new Twitter now, and talk about that. He says, congratulations to Harriet Hagman on her great and very decisive win in Wyoming. This is a wonderful result for America and a complete rebuke of the unselect committee of political hacks and thugs. Liz Cheney should be ashamed of herself the way that she acted and her spiteful, sanctimonious words and actions towards others. Now she can finally disappear into the depths of political oblivion where I am sure she will be much happier than she is now. Thank you, Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I think it's perfect. You know, she... It, it, she, you know, when you listen to her speech, she couched it as this... She's been in this fight to preserve democracy and the constitution yeah. and and i mean let's look back at this whole thing i mean where has the constitution and democracy been more threatened was it that yeah. was it the events of january 6th that when some people you know engaged in violence mm -hmm. and the vote was delayed for some hours yeah um, so that was a bad thing but prior to that the whole previous four years you had you know, the Russia hoax, mm -hmm. you had the Mueller investigation, which was all meant to undermine. And even Nancy Pelosi was yeah. saying the, you know, the illegitimate president or things yeah, to that effect. They she were was, trying to impeach him all the way back then. Yeah. And Hillary Clinton and all these high profile Democrats were casting doubt on the 2016 election. And then you had the investigations. And then immediately at the end of Mueller's mm -hmm. uh, appearance, you had the impeachment, you know, stuff mm -hmm. that was deep state folks, Finman, whomever, all these people. Yes. And so then you had the impeachment, which was over nothing. There was no quid pro quo. There was, mm -hmm. you know, there maybe they would have had a case if Trump had tried to use our assets to get a, an investigation, but there was no investigation and there was, and they got the money then yeah. uh, Ukraine did. So I, and, and then, you know, since then, now we just had this raid where the FBI yeah, went in. Mar-a-Lago <laughs> now is they're trying to make sure that Trump cannot win in 2024 now so it's just been a constant attacking trump from the left side doing everything that they can in the justice system which now has been so ruined from the way that they are using it it's so weaponized that it's really really hurt the actual american constitution and democracy as they like to call it and exactly the it's institutions. Really, I yeah, mean, the institutions. Key, key that institutions. We have. Yeah. Exactly. The FBI. We got to be able to trust the FBI and are yeah. the DOJ, the Department of Justice. You know, if they're not, you know, weighing the scales equally, that's mm -hmm. problems because they've got the power um, to ruin people's lives. Yeah. And uh, Trump's obviously a very big person, uh, so he's got a lot of things he can use to try to thwart them, as he has these last yes. years. But I mean. It's intimidation, and it, it, it is a true threat to our democracy. If people don't feel free to protest against their government, as the yeah. First Amendment says they're allowed to do, for fear of being labeled an insurrectionist, mm -hmm. that's a threat to democracy. What they're doing on the January 6th committee is a threat to democracy. What what Liz Cheney's been standing up for, she's, she's not been standing up for democracy. Yeah. Uh, if they'd had a panel that said... You know, that had both Republicans and Democrats like Jim Jordan and others saying, mm -hmm. why didn't we have the right security there that day? You know, yeah. why? that would have been a legitimate inquiry. What what this was just a sham. Yeah, yeah. It was just a sham. And it's been so funny to see what how Twitter is is re reacting to this, how Donald Trump Jr. is reacting to this. I love this. He says Liz Cheney compared herself to Lincoln. He's laughing. I'm not going to say what that is. <laughs> that that CNN and the MSN DNC. MS DNC, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fluffing really got to her carpetbagger slash warmonger head. And it says now hiring 
rhinos. That is hilarious. I've loved seeing all the different memes that have been out there. My favorite one is the one where Liz Cheney is now begging for a job. She says, looking for a job on The View or C CNN, looking like she is homeless. And that's just hilarious. That's really where she's going to be able to put her career trajectory now is towards the liberals, but still pretending to be a Republican. No, she'd be perfect for The View. I, I think that would be a wonderful place for her to go because, <laughs> I mean, then they can check their box. We have a Republican. It's kind of like the January 6th. Yes. We have a Republican on the panel. And and then she can comment and say all her anti-Trump things and the whole table can be in agreement that, that we've had a discussion and this is the way it is. So, I mean, that's the view. I mean, that's, yeah. that is their view. They don't like Trump and she fits that view. And so mm -hmm. she should be put right in that spot. Yeah. It'll fit the agenda <laughs> for yeah, yeah, them. Yeah. And there was another election last night in Alaska, and we had a lot of great results there. The Republicans prevailed, the ones endorsed by President Trump, and they were able to win pretty handily, specifically specifically the Senate race. Randy, can you tell us a little bit more about the Senate race? Well, you know, that's an interesting one. You know, Trump had said, you know, I'm going to, he had pledged like in 2021, he said, I'm going to go to Alaska and I'm going to campaign against Lisa Murkowski. And then earlier this summer, he, he did that. I've lived in Alaska a couple of times working on um, Senate races. Oh, very and, cool. And for Joe Miller in 2010 and some after that. And so I, I've gotten to see kind of the lay. And so we ran against her twice. Mm -hmm. We beat her in the primary in 2010. And then she was able to come back in the general in a three-way race and win. So I guess that's the danger here. So you've got Trump. He's endorsed Kelly Chewbacca. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, um, Lisa Murkowski, got the highest number of votes in mm -hmm. their kind of jungle primary. You know, where, <laughs> yes. <laughs> where that's the, a great way to put it. <laughs> so they get the top four get to go on to the general. Mm -hmm. And so Lisa Murkowski, and it was, there was no doubt that Lisa Murkowski was going to go on to the general, given the name recognition and you know, the establishment Republicans. And she kind of has a coalition of Native Americans who, mm -hmm. you know, Native Alaskans who voter, who back her candidacy and then moderate Democrats and Republicans. And so mm -hmm. she's got kind of this coalition there. And then, but on the Republican side, it's interesting. You, you had uh, Kelly and then others. And so it's going to be interesting. You know, they've got now this rank order voting up there. Yeah, rank choice voting, which is so confusing and basically, it's the voter is able to rank who they like the best and then go down from there. It's so weird. Yeah, no, I've looked into this a little more and I, because I wondered at myself exactly how it works. Yeah. So if, if Murkowski or Chewbacca or Chewbacca or mm -hmm. any of those were able to uh, get beyond 50% of the vote, mm -hmm. they're the winner. So that's, that's, a, yeah, so, that, so that's kind of old school in that sense. Now, Murkowski has not gotten that percentage of the vote in any of these elections. Like mm -hmm. when we ran against her, she got, I think it was 38 or 39 percent. We got mm -hmm. 35 percent. Joe did, Joe Miller. Yes. And then, um, and then the Democrat got in the 20 percentage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so she's not really attained that recently. But the way rank order voting, and when Trump was up there in Alaska, mm -hmm. he said this. She got this put in there. Now it was a voter initiative, but yeah you know, somebody had to get behind it and push it to the public as a, as a good idea. And <laughs> yeah. so he feels that Markowski and her allies were kind of behind all this. Mm -hmm. And um, so what happens is, so they take the the top, the one that got the least amount of votes for their top choice mm -hmm. gets kicked out. And then they take that person's second choice, that, that you know, the people who voted mm -hmm. for that candidate second. And the idea is that you keep going through this process until somebody gets over 50%. Mm -hmm. But as the Heritage Foundation has pointed out and others, what you end up with is you could actually have somebody who got more votes, more mm -hmm. of a percentage of the raw votes on election night, losing to someone who got, you know, less. Yes. But in this whole mismatch, yeah. mis you know, mismatch, however you want to say it, <laughs> mismatch, <laughs> anyway, they end up getting more. And so that's how Murkowski could be aided by this. So I I mean, I hate to say it, but she seems like she's in a pretty good position to potentially right now. win in November. But, you know, there's shifting to be done. And if Chewbacca can get beyond that 50%, then it's race over, right? Yeah. I don't think Markowski can. I don't think she can. 
But the Democrats will probably in Alaska, which mm-hmm. there are a significant number, including a, a buddy of mine I went to college with. <laughs> but, yeah. but anyway, uh, you they would probably put Murkowski as their second choice, which I think. So I think it'll that, it'll move the scale a little bit more. And the Heritage Foundation has such a great article explaining why this is so bad because. You know, a lot of people are like, I don't even understand what it is. Why is it bad? And the Heritage Foundation basically has key takeaways from it that it disenfranchises voters and you aren't really able to have the debates that would be best and that their dialogue is eliminated and that it's basically a scheme to disconnect the election issues and allow candidates with marginal support from voters to win. Right. Yeah, that's what he said. It's kind of a retain power type thing. That's what one of the experts at Heritage had said, that it's yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a way to, to hold on to power. It is. And yeah, which Murkowski wants to do. <laughs> Alaska, this is their first time using ranked choice voting. It was just put on the ballot in 2020 and voters decided to vote for ballot measure two. And that's why this is the first time that we are using this and seeing this. And so Murkowski won by 44% to 40% Kelly. And then Sarah Palin was also a candidate now. And she ran again in the house for district one and she didn't win the very first uh, choice but she did win about uh, i believe 32 percent of the vote um and so she was able to prevail and move on to the next step this is a special election for her and so they're using this to really be able to manipulate the way that people vote and it's it's very confusing ranked choice voting, but we do know now Sarah Palin is moving forward and we'll have to see how that plays out in the general election. No, yeah, that, that race was interesting too because the Democrat candidate got the most votes. As I said, there's a yeah. pretty significant Democratic vote up here, even though Trump has won Alaska handily. Mm-hmm. But, you know, around Anchorage and although Anchorage right now has a Republican mayor, so that's different from when I was up mm-hmm. there. But and Mark Begage, who is Nick Begage's brother. Yeah. Nick Begage was running on the Republican side uh, against Sarah Palin. And so he's also advancing to the gen- uh, general election. Sarah mm-hmm. Palin got the most votes of any Republican running. Yes. So between the two of them, I w- looked it up earlier, they got about 87,000 votes and then uh, the Democrat candidate got 53,000. So I think in that case, Palin's probably in a pretty good position because she will probably be the second choice to the Nick, Nick Begage yes. voters. And so I think then she could get over the 50% and beat the Democrat. So I, I, again, not being a total expert on how this works up there, and it's pretty new up there, it seems that she's in a good position to win that House seat. I agree. It's interesting. In a way, is this kind of like polling in that you're able to see, well, this is actually how the election would play out. The Democrat would, you know, potentially get more votes than Sarah Palin. I think that's very interesting to see how voters ahead of the election, of like ahead of the general election, are able to see really how it played out in the primary opposed to the, you know, two Republicans running against each other, which is the way that we have it in Arizona and typically all other states. And so, yeah, it's very interesting to see how this played out. And Alaska has really been a pioneer for ranked choice voting. And I'm hoping that it does not (laughs) go to other states. However, other states have really been pushing for it as well. And it's really been more of a democratic uh, agenda pushing for it. Anything that involves watering down elections or (laughs) are changing things or changing the rules, the Democrats are usually for that because right now the Republicans have been doing well. And even in this last 2020 Mm -hmm. election, you know, we, we, I like, I'm a Republican, but (laughs) they, they picked up, uh, we picked up seats in the house, which is highly unusual to have the top of the ticket lose and then them to pick up seats in the house. So, and then in the state legislatures and then the governorship. So the Republican party is popular. Uh, yeah. And especially through this pandemic, 
you know, you, you hear these stories of people even in the Northeast who are like, I've never voted for a Republican, but now I am. Now I am. <laughs> because they were so incredibly bad during the pandemic. So there is another candidate who in their state has been historically left, which is now shifting to the right. Our special guest is Christine Drazen, and she is the gubernatorial candidate for the Republican Party in Oregon. It is historic to see how people are moving to the right now after all the craziness that has gone on in the last couple of years. Hi, it's great to be here with you today. So you are the gubernatorial candidate for Oregon, and that is now a race that was typically ran Democrat, but now they're seeing that you are going to be, the state is leaning Democrat opposed to being typically Democrat. There's also polls that put you one point ahead. Why do you think that Oregon, who is typically liberal, is now moving towards the right? Yeah, my opponent's policies, my opponent's records, and frankly, Kate Brown, our current governor, her, her approach to our state leadership in our state has led Oregon down the wrong track, in the wrong direction for far too long. It's harmed Oregon families, regardless of political affiliation. And we have a real opportunity this year to help Oregonians restore quality of life for Oregonians across our whole state and flip Oregon for the first time in 40 years. So you've talked about Measure 110 in your plan for Oregon's future that you recently released. Can you talk about what Measure 110 is and how it has hurt Oregon? Yeah, Oregonians a few years back had a ballot measure in front of them that focused on the need to have support for people that were facing addiction, recovery services. And so they passed the ballot measure. What the measure actually did was legalize hard drugs like fentanyl, heroin, meth. And we know that with the homeless crisis facing our state right now, that the majority of people that, that are homeless on our streets, in fact, are actively using hard drugs. It's legal in Oregon for the first time. We have to repeal that measure. We have to restore our ability for police to intervene, to get folks the help that they so desperately need. We have to respond to the crisis in our streets with both compassion and accountability. And to do that, we have got to reverse the measure that legalized hard drugs in our beautiful state. Crime has been up in Oregon as well. Do you think that the decriminalization of these drugs could be a reason for that? Yeah, I think that the decriminalization plays into it, but more than anything else, it's leadership. We have had leadership that has not supported law enforcement and instead has treated police criminals and criminals like victims for too long in our state. It's time for leaders that understand the connection between supporting law enforcement and having safe communities and safe streets. That's what Oregonians want. That's what Oregonians need. The current governor is Kate Brown, who is a Democrat. And you have before called her, uh, your new opponent, a identical to Kate Brown. Can you talk a little bit about Tina Kotek, your opponent, the Democrat, and what you would do differently if you were in charge of the state. Tina Kotek, who is the Democrat, former Speaker of the House, she is absolutely a dangerous, progressive, uh, extreme uh, Democrat who primarily focuses on a global agenda that hurts Oregonians. And at this point, Oregonians have to, have to choose change. We can't have another four years of Kate Brown. And both of my opponents represent another four years of Kate Brown. As a Republican, what could you do to help satisfy those people that do care about the environment without doing the Green New Deal like is in that new bill? Yeah, here in Oregon, we've always been a leader on climate issues. It's part, it's, it's part of our culture here in our state to really respect and, and prize our, in our, our environment. And so Oregon has right now moved away from coal powered energy. We have clean fuel, a clean fuels program. Uh, we have recycling, we, have, we are a national leader in recycling. And certainly we have invested deeply in energy efficiency. Uh, and to add on to all of that, half of Oregon uh, is green. We're trees, we grow trees here. And that actually adds to carbon sequestration, which benefits 
uh, the the issues are the the issues around carbon emissions. So Oregon is doing more than its part when it comes to supporting our environment. Uh, that's part of what many Oregonians are proud of. And we don't need additional taxes at the federal level to be able to solve this problem. Your opponent has described herself as a proven progressive for the American people. How would you describe yourself? And also, do you find the term progressive a little scary? Because that's how I view it. I think that when people say progressive, it's the AOCs, the Bernie Sanders. How would you differentiate yourself from your opponent? I'm an Oregonian. I'm a lifelong Oregonian. I love this place. I love I love Oregonians and I, and I and I love my home state. You know, my opponent Tina Kotek has shares a lot in common with A. Um, I would say that she has less integrity and that she cannot be trusted. So, from my perspective, she's worse than AOC. But certainly when it comes to Oregon politics, our state, our state's diverse. We have a lot of different communities across our entire state. This week I've been doing a road trip in Eastern Oregon and I can tell you that, uh, that our state does not need more progressive leaders. We need people that are willing to listen, people that are willing to serve on behalf of our state, not just an extreme political agenda. How do you think that, you know, with this 40 years potentially you know, shifting to the right. How do you think that you will fare in the midterm election? Do you think that Oregonians will finally choose a Republican after all these years? I have, I've released a roadmap for Oregon's future. Focus is on the issues that Oregonians care the most about right now. Responding to our homeless crisis, the crisis on our streets, uh, supporting law enforcement, restoring safe communities, tackling our affordability crisis, and, and getting Oregonians back into work, back into the workforce, and frankly, supporting our education system. I mean, Oregon schools were among the best in the nation to reopen, and our kids suffer because of that. And on top of that, we have this progressive agenda, which has added politics into our classroom and really has distracted away from that we have to graduate kids and set them on a course for their best possible future. Oregonians care about good government. They care about the issues that are affecting them around their kitchen table every single day. And that's not what my opponents are focused on. My opponents are focused on extreme political agenda. And we are going to win in November in this midterm election because Oregonians recognize across the political spectrum that we need change. And in Oregon, with single party control for a decade, we also need balance in our political life. We need someone who is willing to stand up and veto tax increases. We need someone who's willing to stand up and fight for Oregon families and businesses. And I will be that governor. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time and good luck on your race. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. That was a wonderful interview. And it's so cool to see all of the candidates that are coming out in the 22 midterm elections. It'll be super interesting to see how things play out in the general. We are going to stay very tapped in to these elections. And it was so great to have Randy, you on the show, because you know so much about politics as well. And we hope we're going to have you again, Randy. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day and make sure to tune in every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday.